Welcome to Side Trips, where we take a detour with your favorite authors and chat about their favorite passions, pet projects, and pastimes. I am so excited today to welcome award-winning author Callie White Van Bali. And Callie is here from Iowa, like I am, um, yes. part of the state, from across the state. But I'm so glad you're here. Um, your newest novel, The Monsters We Make, will be out by the time this airs. Yes. And I'm excited to talk about that, too. But right now, we're going to chat about um, something that's near and dear to your heart, I know, your work with mental health and the ad advocacy with that. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how you got started? Yeah, well, first, thank you, Heather. It's always so nice to see you and get a chance to visit with you. Um, yeah, so uh, mental health care and mental health care reform became a real passion project of mine. Um, in April of 2017, um, I, my longtime neighbors, um, who I had lived, we had lived next to right across the street for over 15 years at that point, were tragically shot and killed. Um, it was a husband, wife, and their 24-year-old daughter um, that were tragically shot and killed by their um, severely mentally ill son, um, a young man named Chase, who had um, undertreated schizophrenia and bipolar disorder at that time um, and had a, a very serious psychotic break um, when this happened. And like I said, we had known the family for 15 years, the daughter, Tawny, was our kid's babysitter for many years. And I, I also knew Chase. He had played with my boys a few times when they were little. He rode the school bus with them. Um, and it was after I discovered, you know, I learned more about the family's struggle to get Chase adequate mental health care help um, that I, I felt galvanized to get involved. Um, um, in the mental health care reform efforts, um, you know, at the time of the murders, he, he was so severely ill and his mother had tried getting him hospitalized. He desperately needed inpatient hospitalization and there were no available beds in the entire state of Iowa. And I think that was the turning point for me. Um, and I started out by, I wrote a few um, articles for the Des Moines Register about the family's case and the state of mental health care in Iowa. I joined NAMI Iowa, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and through them, I started getting involved in their annual fundraiser, their walk that they do every year. I attend their conference every year. Um, and finally, I learned how to lobby legislators, state legislators, um, for different mental health care reform pieces of legislation. So I've been doing that now for about three years. Wow. What, yeah. What a, a, just a her terrible, heartbreaking catalyst um, to bring you to that. Yeah. I, you know, as an educator <clears throat> for 25 years and more, um, you know, I think what I've noticed and what my fellow teachers are saying is that, you know, their biggest concern about their students isn't their math and their reading skills. It's their, the, their students' mental health. And I think, you know, in Iowa, you know, where we live, especially um, in the past decade or more, we've really seen a downturn in support of mental health resources for everybody, but especially young young adults young children and children for sure and iowa has never had a children's mental health care system um it only recently was formed uh last year during the legislative session although it still doesn't have any funding um and in addition to that uh you know when our, we had a governor several years ago, Governor Terry Branstead made a lot of changes to the healthcare system when two of our four state hospitals were pretty abruptly closed and the, that sort of treatment was shifted to the general public. Um, that was pretty devastating. It's had a lot of negative effects and funding was cut at the same time. It was all sort of a snowball and then Medicaid was privatized. 
Um, so a lot of healthcare providers aren't getting reimbursed, so therefore they don't want to treat um, mentally ill people who are in acute crisis um, instances like the Chase Nicholson case. Um, it's been sort of a snowball effect and it's taking years now to undo a lot of the things that were put in place that just clearly were not working. And you, you mentioned that you actually have gone to the legislature mm -hmm. and spoken on behalf of mm -hmm. mental health and support. Are you seeing some uh, any winds of change? At that I, yes, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I, have, I have lobbied now three years in a row. The first year, I only lobbied my um, district, uh, my state senator and my state representative um, and I was the first time I didn't know what I was doing. I was very nervous and um, probably very um, not smooth at all in what I was doing. Um, but like anything, you know, you just got to jump in and do it and you learn as you go. And I've gotten better at it. And I, I have sensed that there is um, a lot of support, but at the same time, um, I encounter just as much resistance because like everything, it always comes down to money. Funding, absolutely. Funding. Yeah. Well, um, changing tack just a little bit, I mean, your newest novel, um, The Monsters We Make, mm -hmm. has been, uh, which deals with some mental health issues. In, to in, a degree, yes. To a degree, um, and is a novel that uh, that I absolutely adored. I was lucky enough to get a Thank you. and it was like opening up a book and seeing my childhood because it was set in 1980s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And um, so it just, there was a lot of, a lot of pieces that I really related to. And I like a, a good thriller, a good mystery. And so Booklist says, um, an air of menace, laced with melancholy, hangs over every page, a mourning for a more innocent time that perhaps was never real. The monsters were always there, we just couldn't see them. That's from Booklist on um, the monsters we make. Can you tell us a little bit about your new novel? Yes, so um, the new book is, it's a night, as you said, it's a 1980s family drama and it follows the disappearance of these two paper boys from Des Moines, and it's based on the real, uh, the real life missing paper boy cases of Johnny Gosh in 1982 and Eugene Martin in 1984, and how um, those two cases have these devastating effects um, on, a, on these characters who live in the neighborhood where the second boy goes missing, um, and it follows her two children, a 12-year-old boy named Sammy, who's also a paper boy in the neighborhood at the time, his older sister, Crystal, and a local cop, and then how all, th all three of these characters' um, involvement in the case um, and the, the sort of events that get set in motion with the case, how all of them converge at the end in sort of this um, devastating outcome. Yeah, not super happy. Um, <laughs> but Stories. But, I'm not known for those type of stories. Either am I. Either am I. I know. I know. I it's. I get that a lot. Sort of those, those gentle questions of, you seem fine, but are you really? <laughs> Childhood like. Yes. yes. I get that a lot too. But you know, so so beautifully written. And Thank you. So, like I said, like stepping back and in, into childhood in some ways for me. So I, I really loved it. And I think readers everywhere are going to love it as well. Thank um, you. And, you know, talking back about advocacy and, and mental health, what can people like me and just every, you know, everyday people, what can we do to support um, mental health awareness in our own communities? What are some ways that you suggest? Well, first and foremost, especially this year, is vote. And to vote for um, in local elections, you know, and vote for state representatives who um, support mental health care reform and especially mental health care funding. Um, and, you know, not to be afraid to contact legislators 
if I know I have contacted you a few times asking you, could you please reach out to your state rep or whatever for um, when there was a big mental health care funding package coming up and and that's really what it takes is people, you know, speak just voters speaking up and then showing up at the polls. Those are the two biggest things really. Right. And we, I think as a, the more we realize that as a community, as a state, as a, a nation, we fund what we value. And this is one way that, you know, that if we make our voices heard, we can get the help that people so desperately need um, and families the help that they need. Absolutely. Yes. Callie, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your passion with us. Um, it's always so great to talk to you and uh, readers everywhere should reach out and snag up uh, the monsters we make, which will be available everywhere um, by the time this airs. So thank you so much, Callie. Thank you, Heather. It's always wonderful to chat with you.